What a nightmare. I need to put this in a spreadsheet. That's not right. Let's see if it boots. And now my keys are stuck? <sighs> All right. I uh, thought you were working on the instruction set for the Centurion. What does it look like I'm doing? Not that? Good luck, dude. All right. Hello and welcome back. And well, as you saw on our nice little short film there, we're working on the TI-99 today. Uh, there's a couple big problems that we need to address. The first is, well, the most obvious one, it's that something is clearly wrong with the video. This background color on the TV, camera probably doesn't pick it up very well, but it's supposed to be a nice light blue, and it is a very dark blue, and all of the text is broken. The other issue you saw was that my uh, keyboard here is sticking, and you may also have noticed that the keyboard is a white keyboard instead of the black keyboard it should be. When I got this system, it had the black keyboard in it, but it was a membrane keyboard, and it was totally thrashed. So I found this white mechanical keyboard on eBay, bought it, threw it in, and it works perfectly, but I got the alignment not quite right, so this top row of keys uh, jams up against the, the case, and they don't return. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take this completely apart, uh, realign the keyboard, take a look at the video circuit and see if we can't figure out why it's displaying garbage on here. Hopefully we can get it fixed up and then we can plug it all back into the massive train of sidecars and maybe if we're lucky we can get Multiplan to boot. So that is the goal. Let's get to work. To get this whole thing apart, first we'll remove the speech synthesizer sidecar that I forgot to remove earlier. Then we'll flip it over and there is just seven screws on the back. Remove these seven and then the bottom just lifts straight off. Although I forgot to pull the power switch out, which gave me a little bit of grief. However, once we have it open, we can start removing the individual pieces, starting with the power supply. And there are just two screws holding the power supply in. With those two screws removed, it lifts right out of the way, and the socket for where the plug from the power brick plugs in comes right with it. Then there's just three screws to remove the motherboard, which is encased entirely in a metal RF shielding that also doubles as the mounting tabs for the motherboard. Once we've got the motherboard loose, we'll just flip it over and disconnect the keyboard from the bottom, and then it's just four screws to remove the keyboard. Now that we've got all the pieces removed from the case, let's go ahead and free the motherboard from its RF shielding prison. And to do this, first we need to remove the cartridge riser board, then there are two large metal clips that slide right off the edge, and finally there are three screws that go through the shielding and motherboard to clamp it all together. And once we have those all removed, we can just lift the RF shielding right out of the way. All right, we've got everything extricated from its RF shielding cage, 
And now that we're getting a good look at the motherboard, man, I just think it's a really cool design. The star of the show is obviously the uh, TMS9900 here. This is the CPU, and it is a genuine 16-bit CPU, which was pretty rare for the year that the TI-99 came out. But the reason that it's a 16-bit CPU is because it was not designed to be used as a home computer. The TMS9900 is actually a microprocessor evolution of the original TI-990 mini computer. And here's a block diagram for the original 990 and we can see it's set up pretty similar to mini computers of the era which was purely for data control. But this diagram is actually from 1974, back when the TI-990 boards were all TTL logic. And this ultimately grew up into this. This is kind of a much later version of the TI-990. And you can see that uh, the things that it was designed to interface with grew pretty dramatically. So it was still very much so a business-oriented machine. And this TI-990-4 actually used a TMS-9900 micro processor. So it was also being used in the late model TI 990s. So when they implemented it in the TI 99, there were a lot of things that didn't translate well to the home market. And the number one thing that everybody dings the TI 99 for is the relative lack of memory that's going on. The CPU only has 256 bytes of scratch pad memory available to it, which are in these uh, two static RAM chips over here that are pretty high speed, but 256 bytes is practically nothing when it comes to writing programs. So where is all of the rest of the memory on the system? And well, it's right here. This is a collection of 41 16 dynamic RAM chips, and there is 16K available here for the machine. But there's a big asterisk on that 16K because the CPU cannot directly access this 16K. It has to send a request through the VDP, which is over here. So it's kind of like a coprocessor to the CPU, but this memory can only be written to or read from by the VDP itself. And the VDP is only operating on eight bits. So even though this is a proper 16-bit CPU, the VDP is kind of strangle holding it down to uh, eight bits. But at the end of the day, there is still a 16-bit address bus going on, which means that we have 16 bits of addressable memory space that we should be able to access. So why do we only have 16K available? Available to us. Well, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Between the uh, 0000 and the 2000 range, we've got the console ROM. Between 2000 and 4000, we've got some low memory expansion. 4000 to 6000, we've got peripheral card ROMs. Uh, 6000 to 8000 are where the cartridge ROMs live. And then 8000 to A000 is where all of the scratch pad RAM is and uh, MMIO or, or memory mapped input output. And this is where the TI-99 pretty much does all of its work with RAM, uh, except that there's a huge amount of space from A000 to FFFF that is not being used. And that can actually be mapped to a high memory expansion sidecar, which gives the TI-99 an additional 32K of memory. And I happen to have one of those over there. And so the machine is actually much more capable if you tack on all the right sidecars. But the problems that we're having are all related to video. Now the VDP does need a heatsink on it and the actual metal RF shielding touches it with a bit of thermal paste to supply a heatsink to it. So it is possible that this thermal paste is no good anymore and that has caused my VDP to prematurely fail. I don't know if you can call it premature after 40 years, but uh, I think that's probably not the case. The far more likely thing is probably these 4116 RAM chips. These things are notorious for being bad. So I'm gonna pause the camera for a little bit and go do my proper due diligence to figure out how I can go about figuring out which one of these is bad. So while I was troubleshooting this, I noticed that if I touched the video cable, everything went completely wonky. The screen would flicker and change color, 
but there was on the occasion a brief glimpse of clarity? Well, it turns out that the grounding lugs of the video cable connector were completely broken free, and that is definitely gonna cause a lot of issues. So I got the soldering iron hot, and we re-soldered them right in. However, while the soldering iron was still hot, I decided to replace this capacitor over here, which looks uh, pretty corroded and nasty. However, I do not believe that this capacitor has anything to do with the video circuit. It's just something that needed to be done. And I didn't have another axial capacitor to replace it, so I just bent the legs around on a radial cap and used a piece of heat shrink tubing to hold it all in place. Now that we've got the connector resoldered and the capacitor replaced, I fired it up to give it another check and it still looks like garbage. But I checked the composite signal that's going to the TV here and it looks totally fine. And I also checked the data out on each of the 4116 RAMs and they're all working correctly as well. So either we've got something horrific going on deep in the TI-99 itself that's going to take a boatload of troubleshooting or maybe it's not the TI-99 at all, and it's my TV. If only I had another monitor to test this with. Now I have no idea if this uh, NEC character display for my PC8001 actually works. When I first got the display, I did plug it in and power it on and the speaker made a noise, but the PC8001 itself doesn't work and I don't even have the cable to connect it to the monitor. That's on the list of things to do. So I don't know if it'll actually display a picture, but there's only one way to find out. So we'll go ahead and turn this on. Oh Jesus. That speaker is so scratchy. I think the uh, potentiometer in here needs a lot of work. Uh, but we'll turn the uh, TI-99 on. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, obviously it is a monochrome only display and it's only showing green and it's got uh, extremely visible vertical scan lines, but the text is crystal clear. It looks so good. <laughs> we'll pop it into TI Basic here. Yeah, TI Basic ready. I can read it so much easier. So the TI-99 is working perfectly. The problem is my Sanyo monitor. All right, so we're back down here on the Sanyo monitor and we'll flip up in the bottom panel here and I've got some adjustments. I've got color, tint, brightness, contrast, and vertical hold. And I'm not gonna mess with the vertical hold because, well, that seems to be working, but we'll play with color and see if we can't get it to look a little clearer. But look how disgusting that potentiometer is. Uh, but, well, now we have no color. We're black and white, but the text is crystal clear. It's just the potentiometers are thrashed. So I think I need to uh, shut the monitor off and try and get some deoxit into those potentiometers. All right, so I got some deoxit onto the back of the potentiometers, barely, and then I've been working them uh, back and forth uh, quite a lot, and they actually feel a lot smoother than they used to. So I think we've made some pretty good uh, improvements here. So let's turn the TV on, and I'll turn the TI-99 on and we'll see where we're at. Well, it looks like I got the uh, V-hold in the right spot just out of chance there, and already this looks immensely better than it did before. So we can uh, bring the contrast up a little bit to get a little sharper color out of it. Uh, we'll drop the brightness down just a touch. We can change the tint from green to overly blue, and I'm pretty sure that the TI home screen here is supposed to be like a really light shade of blue. Uh, and then we can either take the color away to make it black and white or way overdo the color and it gets super nasty. Uh, but right about there looks beautiful. That looks amazing. Now in order to properly test multi-plan out, we need to get the floppy disk uh, hooked back up as a sidecar and we also need the 32K memory expansion. So essentially I need to put the TI-99 back together, get it over on the desk, hook all the sidecars up, and fire it up one more time, and see if we can get Microsoft Multiplan fired up completely. 
To reassemble everything, first things first, we need to remove all the old thermal paste, and then we will put some new thermal paste on, so that way our VDP can stay nice and cool. And I went a little heavy on the amount of thermal paste that I'm using, uh, because there's not a very strong contact between the RF shield and the chip, and there might be a little bit of space in there, so the uh, thermal paste needs to fill up that space. And now it's time to reassemble it, and this time I'm going to make sure that I align the keyboard correctly. And uh, giving the keys a quick confirmation push, yep, all looks good. So now that everything's all plugged in, let's see if we can load up Microsoft Multiplan. There we go, we've got Microsoft Multiplan fully booted and working perfectly, and I'm really excited about having my spreadsheet program back. Uh, I'm actually more excited about a spreadsheet program than I would be about a video game. And, well, that's an interesting point that I've gotten to in my life. Uh, but it works and it looks beautiful. The monitor is nice and sharp and easy to read in full color as well, unlike the uh, NEC character display, as beautiful as that monitor is. Uh, the full color, I think, is going to work a lot better for the TI-99. But in order for Microsoft Multiplan to fully boot like this, the disk drive has to work, the disk controller has to work, and the 32K memory expansion has to work. So we know that those sidecars are all working perfectly. However, we can't really confirm the rest of the sidecars just yet. The uh, RS-232 interface, I don't have any RS-232 devices here to test it with, unless I hook this up as a terminal emulator on the Centurion. Mm, that sounds like a cool idea. Uh, but also the solid state printer here, it's not working, and it did work before, so hopefully nothing major has gone wrong in there. I actually managed to get it to do some calculations in print, but that was months ago, so, well, we're going to have to take another look at that in the future. But for now, I've got my spreadsheet up, I've got a lot of work to do on the instruction set for the Centurion over here, and, well, I think it's just time for me to actually get to work. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.